So, hello, and, and hi to Michaela Thomas, who is our wonderful um, guest for this evening. And so Michaela is a clinical psychologist, she's also a couples therapist, and she's founder of the Thomas Connection. And tonight we are talking about relationships, and particularly relationships as we go through the transition of birth. So, Michaela, share a little bit about yourself, if you're happy to, and some of the stuff that you do. Sure, thank you for having me first off. Um, looking forward to this little chat because one of the things I'm really passionate about in my work as a clinical psychologist is to support people in this transitional period, um, not just as couples, but I also help individuals. So I've, I've helped people to let go of the pressure of perfection so that they can lead more meaningful lives, having a bit more balance in how they live, how they love and how they work. Um, so it's that that will probably flavor our conversation this evening as well because I think this transition into parenthood really needs to be one that is allowing imperfection yes. so it's, it's part of what I'm really really passionate about and the kind of people who come to my private practice the Thomas connection probably would be quite stressed anxious feeling a bit low so when that relates to the perinatal period people who come with postnatal depression or people who have anxieties during pregnancy people who have intimacy issues or relationship issues, uh, even infidelities that happen during pregnancy, and then trying to kind of prepare your relationship for this big change to come. Um, I sometimes work with people who are about to get married or have got married and kind of want to connect with their values and what's important to them. So that's sort of what I do, but I don't exclusively work with couples. I do corporate events and things like that as well. And I'm also writing a book about couples. Which is very exciting. So we're looking forward to <laughs> yeah, hearing more about that. I think it was really interesting what you were saying, actually, um, in terms of the work that you do, that, of course, even as we're going through, say, this transition of birth, which is where, you know, we spend a lot of our time focusing on it, the real yeah. birth project, is also essentially everything that's come before that period. So the relationship that's come before, you know, before pregnancy, during pregnancy, it's going to develop through the kind of um, interrelation, um, the, the safety that's created as, as a couple through birth, then also transitions, of course, out again. And do you feel like in your work and in what you see that there are things that people can consider when they are perhaps in pregnancy or even in that kind of fertility preconception stage um, that you think is really useful? Sure. I think one big thing to consider is that having a child is not going to fix your relationship. Mm. Um, it's actually a very common misconception I hear that having a baby might bring us closer together or it's going to strengthen our bond. Or, you know, if we're having a, we would have a bit of a rough patch in our relationship and maybe this is the next step. Maybe this is what we're supposed to be doing. We've been married for a while or we've been living together for a while. Maybe let's make a baby. And in fact, we know that having a child, you know, is the biggest strain on the couple's relationship throughout the lifespan of the relationship. So that first year after the first baby's been born is, the, statistically speaking, the, the, the trickiest point. So no, having a baby does not make you closer together as such. Uh, it will help you uh, experience hardship. It will help you to understand what it's like to weather a storm. So I think in preconception stage, you need to really um, make sure that you are communicating quite well, you know, that you're able to share thoughts and feelings with each other, that you feel strong enough to be able to go through this challenge. Um, and obviously I'm, I'm painting quite a bleak picture and I don't mean to, I just, I think reality is that this is a, a challenge. So if you can prepare yourself for that, like as if, you know, if this is going to be some, you know, a, a rough storm to get through, how do you get your boat set up so that you can sail those seas? Um, knowing that there will be calmer times and there will be rougher times. But if you set out thinking, we're not packed any food, we're not setting, you know, got any extra sails, we're not got an anchor, you're probably going to struggle. Yeah. So rather than having the kind of unrealistic expectation, I think it's important to be checking in with other couples perhaps if you know any friends who have got babies you know what kind of themes did they find you know how do they transition into having freedom and being able to do whatever they wanted to now being actually fairly confined and I think that transition is not just you as a couple it's you each of you as an individual is going to struggle with that transition mm -hmm. and you might also find that you do that differently one of you might be far more extroverted the one of one of you might be more introverted 
you might find that you have um, one of you might have a harder time adjusting to the confinement of, of parenthood and you know the first year or so is actually as we all know with the sleep deprivation it's actually really intense um, so you're not going to be the best versions of yourself so my best tip would be to think how can we cope with both of us being the worst versions of ourselves which I call like the goblin so when you're on the day when you are the goblin, you're sitting there ready to pounce um, on anything and wanting to attack and criticize your partner. Could you cope with both of you being your goblin selves for, for, for months on end? How would you deal with that? Mm. So that's sort of how I think of preparing in the, in the kind of preconception stage. And we also have to, have to keep in mind that not everyone who goes through pregnancy has chosen to do so. Absolutely. It might not be planned pregnancy. It might have accidentally happened. And how you can keep the dialogue uh, open and the communication lines open to talk about how that feels. Maybe you were expecting to be, you know, people who get pregnant on honeymoon, for instance. Perhaps you were thinking we're going to marry, be married for a long time. It's going to be just the two of us doing all of these trips and this connection time we're going to have before we ex expand and make a family. And then it suddenly happens. You know, the, the, the trying for a baby was not much of a trying. It's like for first or second attempt. And then talking about how the, does that feel? You know, what bucket list did you have that you can think of getting done through pregnancy yeah. to feel that you've ticked off a few of those boxes? Does that make sense? It does. And actually, as you were speaking, I was also thinking about, you know, we may be in a, in a relationship with somebody and we might be sort of walking along the same path, but it doesn't mean that when we get to these transitional moments, we're necessarily at the same kind of inner stage. You know, mm -hmm. we might be trying for a baby, but not perhaps both be as fully emotionally ready for that next stage. Um, and so, you know, there, there are other aspects and even sometimes, you know, pregnancies are unplanned. We may not be in an intimate relationship with mm -hmm. the person who is, um the other parent or the other other person involved in this and how we still have to navigate some of those relationships as well and that's where i think communication is so important because there i don't think there's any other transition for a couple where decision making is as important as when you become a parent uh, it's no longer just deciding how you spend your past time what you're going to eat for dinner it's how are you going to raise this tiny human and keep it safe and make sure it survives? And that's where it, it hits upon a lot of old stories. You know, it brings up how you were parented, what you think of as good parenting, you hit upon your different values. So that's where I think communication is, is key, where you can start to think about what kind of values would you want your children to grow up with? So, so for instance, if you valued the, for your child to be kind, caring, respectful, how would you then talk to your spouse or your partner? If you're treating them disrespectfully and you're not particularly kind or caring to them, you can't expect your child to pick up those values that you want them to have. So that's quite a nice way in for, for a lot of couples I work with, where it's not about placing blame on each other. It's just being curious rather than furious about how your value system works and knowing that they will also change. Values are dynamic. So big life changes like having a baby might mean that the values you held as, you know, a 20 something might not be the same as when you're in your 30 something as you progress into parenthood um obviously depending on your age so i think having chats about that you know what's important to you now what matters to you how how would you want our children to grow up how do you want our life to be often i feel there's a friction between couples when they haven't had that chat and they just made a, an assumption and you know the word assume um often makes an ass out of you and me it's, it's, it's yeah, the same. yeah so uh, so that's not very good <laughs> don't, don't make assumptions just check it out with your partner how how would you want us to spend the weekends how would you want us to what kind of holidays would you envision that we would have when we have a child you know one of you might be thinking oh we're going to do those camping holidays that i grew up with and the other one is thinking now we definitely get a summer house and then you you clash right so don't make assumptions check them out and and talk about it yeah definitely i love that phrase that you use curious rather than furious i think that is just brilliant and, and I, there is something as well isn't there and that we might have our kind of conscious level of values that we think we want to bring to parenting but actually we may have witnessed or subconsciously picked up very different values that actually becoming parents ourselves takes us back as you mentioned to those kind of um experiences we had as children the values that were modeled for us that maybe we don't necessarily want to be modeling again but mm. are still there absolutely 
do you think there is a space for couples to be exploring some of that as well beforehand is there a kind of safe way of doing that um i guess depends on how into self-improvement and self-development you are and the the biggest challenge i have with couples is that often there's one partner who's interested in that and the other one isn't and you can't change your partner you can only change yourself mm -hmm. so if you assume responsibility and accountability for your own story how you've been parented the learning history you've had with previous partners how you you know how you've gone through life and all the hard knocks on the way then that will still have a good positive impact on your relationship even if your partner does so, so at all to, to change themselves if you work on you that will still have a positive impact but it can only take you so far so i wouldn't i wouldn't expect anyone to sit down and say to the partner right now we have to read these five books about how to and develop ourselves and so on. But if you are interested, and obviously there are books uh, that can be helpful, we can always put together a little resource list after this to, to recommend a few. Um, but my, in my experience, it, it varies from, from couple to couple how much prep they want to do with that. Um, but I would allow that into the kind of, if you are gonna read books, and it's not everyone who, who wants to do that or necessarily benefits from that, but don't focus just on the sort of what to expect week by week, uh, you know, how your body changes and all of that stuff also work on how your mind will change yeah. and how your heart will change how your soul will change yeah. it's not just the physical growth of your belly if you're the ba the woman carrying the baby it's also how your, your brains will change yes. having a baby will literally change your brain yeah so i think it's important to understand that part of of you as a person as well how your identity will change how what you thought was important will change, how your friendship circles will change. And you might see that as a couple as well, that the people you used to socialize with may fall away somewhat if they, if they don't already have children. And that can be a hard sense of loss for a lot of couples as well. That, you know, actually, who do we see now? Who do we hang out with? Yeah. Who's going to be support for us? Um, and one thing to consider as a couple is to think, what is our external support system like? To take some of the pressure off your partnership so that, you as two partners don't have to meet all the needs in the other person yes. that there are other people who you can lean on you know maybe mom or dad friends that you can lean on um you know um, in-laws people who can provide support and if you don't have that then actually considering saving up a lot of money for for paid support like a postnatal doula um things like that i would definitely recommend because that that extra support we know from research around aspects of good partnership it's actually couples who have support outside of the partnership tend to do better long term so that's that's hugely important and we know that's also a big predictor in postnatal depression is when you haven't had enough support and you feel lonely and isolated so mm. i can't stress that enough don't feel like your partner has to meet all those needs um but it's okay to lean on other people at this time as well and i think that's so true and actually i think one of perhaps one of the bigger challenges when we're going through that first time transition. So when we've gone from being a two to welcoming our baby or our babies that first time, is that we can't necessarily predict, can we, these alterations we're gonna experience in our minds, our bodies as well, but also kind of our, our, you know, our spirit, if you like, our, our very sense of identity. And one of the things that we hear a lot is that, of course, we sort of feel like we're going along that path together and then we have this sort of monumental shift Mm -hmm. and predicting what those needs might be on the other side can be tricky because we feel we might be the same we feel we might have the same network of friends yeah. but then also what can happen is we're not necessarily sharing the experience in the same mm -hmm. way mm -hmm. either so one of us might be taking on uh, you know a greater load in the everyday child care and the child rearing whereas the other might be spending you know a good part of their time where life is still perhaps going to work or keeping to the same routines and their network of friends may still be quite similar whilst mm. one person might have a shift in their network of friends and often that tends to be kind of those taking on the mother the mother role or the mother figure mm. uh, not exclusively but but often it mm. tends to be do you think there are um i think that understanding those needs is such a fantastic way of approaching that do you think there are kind of key conversations that can be had if you find yourself in that position that can help sort of addressing some of those those underlying feelings that might be building up yeah i mean because i guess some of those feelings you're alluding to is, is resentment mm -hmm. that we often have a resentment of the role we find ourselves in and thinking that the other person's role is better um and i've got a lot of sort of insight into this when i was chatting to 
the person who was in a lesbian partnership and they had two children and for each pregnancy they actually took turns doing the sort of the conceiving the birthing and the um the staying at home you know the the maternity leave and then swapped so that both women in that partnership had experienced the you know the strain on them as kind of breastfeeding i think both of them are breastfed as well and so actually the kind of very high contact touch um feeling touched out and they both experienced the same strains mm -hmm. so they did that as a way to kind of even out their maternal load that we often you know, feel that the mental load that the, the maternal figure or the main primary caregiver has regardless of your gender uh, the one who is kind of dealing with the trudging day to day so i think there's a lot more awareness around that now but what there isn't enough awareness of is that the secondary caregiver how that affects them as well um, if they are able to share some of those things in a compassionate way that's putting yourself in the other person's perspective or in the viewpoint and one way i think of that is imagine that you had two towers so this is my tower this is yours if you climbed up into your tower and you see the view from here that's what you see if i'm climbing up in mine i see my view from there and that's what i see our views look very different but if we're just assuming that the primary caregiver is under more strain, which often is the case, we then forget that the strain that the person who has to perhaps carry the full financial load is under, worrying about paying the mortgage, actually maybe seeing their spouse struggling, perhaps feeling depressed or anxious or isolated, then they're having to leave them every morning to go to work. Mm -hmm. So I'm not saying that that, that, that makes the, the first person's strain any better, but it can help us to make space for both partners' experiences. Um, in the couples I see, I often see that the, the secondary caregiver gets a little bit forgotten about, and that can make them more vulnerable to depression or anxiety as well. So having communication, I've said that a lot today, having your dialogue open about what is it like for you? What is your view like from your tower? And can you share mine? You know, can you have a willingness to jump into my tower for a bit or walk a mile in my shoes, if you may? And I'll do the same with you. And you don't have to shout so loudly then to get your view across because you already know that your partner is going to have a willingness to try and emphasize. Okay, what would it feel like if I had to really worry about paying all the, mor like the mortgage and the bills and so on and having to go to work when I've not slept either? What is it like to be alone all day with a young baby and you know going out of your mind, not being able to have an adult conversation and missing your work? actually this is really strenuous for both of us yes that yes. makes sense no absolutely it does and i was thinking you know often when we're preparing for birth um one of the things that i often say to people is to spend a bit of time once a week just checking in and actually that's something that's lovely to do if you're in that stage of now being you know post post birth in that parenting phase is if you can spend you know one evening a week that you put aside and go we're going to just have a half an hour check-in and we're going to climb up each other's towers and just kind of try and see what the view is like from the other side yeah. i think that's really really lovely and it, and it really reminded me of a conversation that comes up a lot with fathers and birth partners and other parent figures who you know who those who haven't experienced pregnancy it's a massive transition for them because often the first encounter, the very sort of physical, um, real encounter they have with this new role is when the baby's there. Um, mm -hmm. And what a massive transition that is. And then that sense of often, you know, responsibility or, or mm -hmm. you know, the, the weight of that, that transition kind of coming all together in, in one moment. Um, and also, being able to see what, whatever the other person might be experiencing, but also perhaps a sense of helplessness is something that came to mind. That, you know, people don't always know how to support mm, their partner. Um, there was, there was um, something you mentioned earlier, and I thought it would be really useful to think about um, the, the, the imperfection, of, our home. <laughs> yeah, the imperfection of, of having kids, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And I'm actually putting myself in my husband's shoes at the moment as I consider what he's experiencing. Yeah, that. yeah it's probably not, you know, trying to tame them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, are there perhaps, um, do you think, um, sort of key, key kind of qualities that we can bring to you know, to our relationships that can help us when we're going through this transition, perhaps values or qualities. Absolutely, absolutely. I, I mean, for me, I would really focus on connection and compassion. Mm. So obviously, I named my company the Thomas Connection, so you see how important that is to me. But compassion, I think, you know, we know that from the research as well, that the 
couples who can and, and individuals who can be compassionate with others, letting that care uh, flow out to other people, actually feel happier themselves as well. So actually, it does good for us to do good for our partner. So not just caring about the well-being of you, but caring about the well-being of your partner. Yes. So having that sense of compassion, and not just for your partner, but also for yourself, that we know it's really hard to give what you haven't got. Yes. So if you are feeling drained and exhausted, and you're not actually doing anything to care for yourself, which we know is often the case during the first year, especially for the, for the primary caregiver, then it'd be really hard to re kind of replenish yourself. How will you then have anything left to give to your partner? Absolutely. So I think that's the sense of being self-compassionate and doing things for you, asking your partner, which is something that a lot of, especially women, struggle to do, mm -hmm. to say what you want and what you need. But that's part of what that weekly check-in can be about. You know, what do you need this week? And need would be things like, I just need a bit more sleep. Okay, how can we help you get more sleep? How can we get you four hours of consecutive sleep? Can we take turns sleeping on the sofa? Can we take turns with the feeds, depending on how your feeds are? That's where negotiation and decision making really comes in. Trying to hold each other in mind with empathy and compassion. Okay, what do you need to get through? This is about surviving. It's not necessarily about thriving in the first year. So having realistic expectations that we'll survive this and then we'll go back up again. We know the relationship satisfaction is going to come back up again after you get through those early years of the child's first, you know, um, or the first few years of the child's life. So Connection, I think, comes from when we turn towards each other, maybe in good times and bad, sharing how we feel, and negative, when we feel sad or angry, fearful, worried. Sharing that with each other builds emotional connection. Sharing, you know, good stuff together, like maybe like, oh man, look, did you see that? I got the child to fall asleep. Oh, look at me. Um, sharing, you know, your successes and your wins, turning towards each other when you're having good times also builds emotional connection. So it's kind of like, sailing those calm seas feels really nice and you think oh we're having a good relationship when we're doing all that when it's only calm seas but actually weathering a storm we, is also something we know strengthens the connection and the bond between two partners mm -hmm. so allowing the good times and the bad times in through connection and then turning towards each other and yourself with compassion that's probably my main takeaway message yeah, no, that's that's really lovely. And I think I was just thinking, you know, particularly if you've come through that birth experience together, you know, sometimes that experience can feel really enriching and nourishing. And sometimes it can feel quite challenging and actually being able to also come out of that and turn towards each other and reflect and hold for each other through that as you transition into parenthood is also a really important aspect of it all, isn't it? That's been so so thoughtful so um insightful and i i really like the the sense of connection and turning inwards because it does create a bit of a triangle doesn't it i mean if yes, having yeah. a family and the analogy we always use was that you know if you imagine your your base as being the base of a pyramid you need those strong foundations there to be able to hold whatever else is going to grow on top yeah. I we would love to chat to you again because I've got lots of other questions that are sort of in my mind. Okay. Um, I think just thinking about the depth and, and the amount, it maybe we'll, we can even have another chat soon. Yeah. As we think about the intimacy and how we build, you know, trust and the physical aspects of having relationships, particularly mm -hmm. if we transition through birth. There's a lot of that changes, doesn't it? Through pregnancy and then after birth too. But um, I just want to say a massive thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And if people want to find out a little bit more about your work and also because you've got your book coming out, which I think is going to be a really useful tool for so many, where, where are good places that they can connect with you? So they can find me on my website, which is the thethomasconnection.co.uk or all on the kind of main social media platforms. So Instagram is the underscore Thomas underscore connection or the Thomas Connection all in one word on Facebook and Thomas Connect on Twitter because Twitch, Twitter's a pain. You can't I know, I noticed that. You have to um, I'm also on LinkedIn under Michaela Thomas and the Thomas Connection is, exists there as well if anyone is interested in more corporate things. And the book is called The Lasting Connection. As you can imagine, I'm really quite keen on connection. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of that is also thinking about imperfection, that it's, it's mm -hmm. focusing on connection, not perfection, uh, is kind of the mantra that I use because otherwise you will assume that your partnership is going to be this kind of riding off in the sunset kind of idea mm -hmm. and then baby hits and you know 
all dignity goes out through the window basically mm -hmm. so i think just having an awareness of that and the final thing i would kind of mention to people is that if you are the birth partner or the you know the secondary caregiver whatever just to be clued up you know knowledge is power read about things like postnatal depression and anxiety beforehand and birth trauma so you know what to look out for in your partner because we know that especially with isolated women the first person who could get you help is your partner Maybe. so make sure that they know what your early triggers are you could even write down a bit of a plan for when is your partner allowed to seek help for you and reach out to people like me you know psychologists who work with perinatal distress because we know that on average people wait you know sometimes people wait years before they seek help for for postnatal depression that's gone untreated and that can have a huge impact on how you feel about you know, the bond with your child your relationship your marriage so don't wait just reach out and speak to someone like me and i can give everyone a 20 minute free consultation if they're interested so yeah you know, it doesn't have to work with me just have a chat and we'll see we take it from there that's amazing michaela thank you so much wishing you um a good evening and we're going to look forward to speaking again soon thank you thank you so much for having me